City Lights on Location now joins writer, producer, director James L. Brooks and the new film is Terms of Endearment. And after starting over, which you wrote the screenplay of and co-produced with your friend, colleague, Alan Pakula, you said that I'd love the first thing I direct not to be my script because <laughs> then I couldn't cop out. And when the car came to drive me to the set, I would say they are doing this because I'm the director. <laughs> what happened, Jim? <laughs> they wouldn't send a car unless I wrote it. <laughs> no, they, I, I, I don't know. Um, I guess I'm very bad at making plans. Uh, this, boy, I, the reason is somebody sent me a book that I had a real reaction to, and it began a process that went on four years. Uh, uh, not only ended up writing it, ended up having the hardest time writing I've ever had in my life. Um, went crazy, wanted to kill myself and others, you know, just all that stuff that you go through um, because it seemed unbeatable. The, it was a very tough script for me, so not only did I write it, it was, uh, it was, uh, it, it, it took something. When you say that Terms of Endearment was a tough script for you, and I think of the irony and the history of Paramount Pictures having Terms of Endearment, and it was the same company, that once fired you on the first rewrite of starting over and didn't even bother to pick up the phone and telephone. It wasn't Paramount, no, it was two individuals. I can't imagine that you remember all these things. There are two individuals uh, who, who had an association with Paramount, but not Paramount Pictures, who fired me without telling me they'd fired me and I kept on writing <laughs> thinking I was employed. But when yeah. you talk about script difficulty, and I think that whether we, we start in 1969 with Room 222 and go through seven wonderful years of Mary Tyler Moore, and Taxi, and Rhoda, and Lou Grant, and the Associates, that it's always been relationships with you. We've always talked about loving things that are populated. And in terms of literature, which is very important in terms of endearment, you said that the wonderful thing about literature is that it reminds us that we are never alone. And I just thought, books, whether in the background or the foreground of whatever you're doing have always been so important. There on this picture, it's one of my, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a scene in the picture where Deborah and, uh, and her new husband are just sort of s going into the house after having the smallest bridal, <laughs> bridal party anybody ever had, and there are paperbacks and stuff mounted all over the place, and, and what, what is her line? Uh, you know, can you imagine there are people all over the world who never read a book? When you, when you say that, and I, another thing I was thinking of by bringing that up with you again, was that overcoming the obstacle you felt with Dan Wakefield's original material and going away from it and trying to create a situation, this is from starting over, where two people who have been lovers emerge as each other's best friend. And again, in terms of endearment, there's the awareness of two people who have been lovers specifically Shirley MacLaine's character and Jack Nicholson's, and her line to him when he's explaining his inability to make a commitment, and she gives that wonderful thing of blah, blah, I feel humiliated, and yet there's more to come. And I thought that really goes through everything. I think everything from Room 222 right up to Terms of Endearment is about relationships, is about, are about people you care about, and you seem incapable of writing any other way? Uh, I keep trying. I, I'm at war with predicting myself. You know, I, I, um, I, I, it's, you know, I looked at this picture and I said, well, that doesn't look that much different from, you know, and in some way it's not that different from, from things I've done before, so I agree with you there. Um, but it felt very different during it. Uh, in starting over, I was doing some personal writing, I'd gone through the experience of the man, I wanted to write about it, I needed to write about it. This was much more journalism for me. Uh, areas of the country I'd never been to before where I had to go down, uh, kinds of people I never wrote about before. Uh, and I, I, you know, there was a, there was, I felt there were three, three things that happened to me with this script. Part where I felt like I was writing alone, part where I felt like I was faithfully rendering Larry McMurtry's work, and part where I felt like I was collaborating with him. City Lights on Location returns with Jim Brooks. We are talking about terms of endearment. I thought of another thing. I wish I could have been on the set the first day you called action on terms of endearment. 
Because Larry Gordon, who is a producer and a friend of yours, <laughs> why are you laughing already? Because I, I, how do you know all these? I mean, it's amazing, these things you're bringing up. Your friend Larry Gordon said, you know what's going to happen, Jim? The first day on your movie, a big bus is going to pull up, <laughs> and all these people are going to get out, and they're going to be your producers, because you said, I want to be protected. <laughs> well, producer, <laughs> director, yeah. screenwriter, yeah. who got off the bus for you on terms of endearment the first day? Um... Well, there was, I'll tell you something that happened in terms of producing, because to, to address it that way. Uh, there's a, uh, on starting over, there was, a, there was a, a DGA trainee, which is the lowest rung on the ladder you have to pass a test to get there. It's Penny Finkelman, who was, it was her first job, and she gets coffee for people who get coffee for people who get coffee for people. I mean, that's what the job is. I wanted her as a second assistant director on this picture, because she had progressed to that point. And she ended up as co-producer by the end of the picture. Just you know, so she was, she was a great help, and uh, and she was promoted, I think, eleven or twelve times in the course of the film. <laughs> when you and when you and Alan Pakula were getting ready to start work on starting over, Alan Pakula screened a film for you one evening called *The More the Merrier*. There was very little said about the choice. And I'm going to have one of my old school teachers come out soon. I, <laughs> I have that. You must remember, we have talked yeah. before. Yes. I just well. haven't forgotten any of it. But the reason for looking at the kind of wonderful romantic comedy drama that The More the Merrier was, was Alan Pakula's explanation of a certain spirit. Terms of endearment not only has a certain spirit, one can really say with authority that it is a comedy drama. And the definition of comedy drama in American film has been so maligned but there isn't a moment, you obviously, this is only my opinion, you couldn't make us cry without making us laugh the way you do in terms of endearment first. And I just wondered if there were any films you looked at for a certain spirit before the first day of photography. My answer is one that no one accepts, and I don't blame them for not accepting it, because it seems, I, I can't tell you what it has to do with terms of endearment. All I can tell you is that I kept on looking at it, and that was best years of our lives. A certain spirit. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, I kept on looking at that. What did you walk I, away I, with from William Wyler's The Best Years of uh, Our Lives? Just enormous decency and a good feeling about its people. Just a real good feeling about its people. Uh, and brilliantly, I mean, brilliantly rendered, just the obvious. And there's the. Uh, the scene in there when Frederick March is getting drunk and, and, and giving that speech to the bankers and you think his life is going to be a disaster and it suddenly takes that turn, that turn was so rich to me. And I think, you know, Terms of Endearment tries to take a lot of turns, a lot of turns, where turns become a straight line, you know? Well, I, I told you that each time in Terms of Endearment that we think we know what's about to happen. Also, I should tell you something. It's very difficult to sit with you and discuss terms of endearment because I think anybody who gave away any kind of dramatic development in that film should be drawn and quartered. <laughs> Thank and you. I, yeah, I, I hope you've you. been discreet in what you've allowed to go out as film clips. Yes, yes, very much so. Very much so. And, and I'm, we got our first review today, and I'm thrilled that, uh, that David Anson in Newsweek did as you, as you said, yeah. I've read it, and I'm, I'm understanding why you're thrilled. On that note about film clips, let us take a break and have a look at a scene from Terms of Endearment. Great. Okay? City Lights on Location will return with Jim Brooks and more on Terms of Endearment right after this. Stay tuned for more with James L. Brooks as City Lights on Location continues. City Lights on Location returns with Jim Brooks. We are talking about Terms of Endearment. One of, one of the most rewarding things about Terms of Endearment, and I might as well stop being subtle. I love the movie. I just think it's a wonderful motion picture. And one of the things that is wonderful about it is what Shirley MacLaine gives us, what Deborah Winger and Jack Nicholson and Jeff Daniels and John Lithgow, your, your casting is immaculate. And I was thinking because of the casting and what Shirley MacLaine, Deborah Winger and Jack Nicholson give us as the characters you have written, is unique. And again, it goes back to your association 
with Alan Pakula because you said about Alan Pakula and your respect and admiration for his work that he made stars actors. And I think what you've done with those three principles is to take star presences that we think we know and yourself makes stars actors. Uh, I think, I don't think I did that. I think, I think that they're, they are, will be, forevermore have been actors, these stars that we're talking about. And it was their commitment to that that made the picture. Uh, I thought I could never cast the astronaut part in this picture because it need, what it needed and the age man that it needed, if they were that good, they'd be a star, which Jack is. And if they were a star, they wouldn't do the third role in a picture. And he did the role. I mean, that's, that's somebody who's committed to creating characters, as Deborah is, as Shirley is. And uh, yeah, and they'll, and they'll always do it. I mean, De Deborah is not going to do a star turn on her next picture. She's going to create a character on her next picture. When you speak that way, particularly about Deborah Winger, and you said about her during the shooting, that with Deborah Winger, it's stop or go. She has no cruising speed. She's prepared to take chances. She risks things as an actor. And I was thinking that early on when you were thinking about people, one of the people who came to mind was Sissy Spacek. But it's Deborah Winger's role, and she does it brilliantly. But what was the edge? What was the final thing where you said, it is Deborah Winger? Uh, it's, it's hard to respond to because the truth of the matter is that, it could have, that a few things could have happened on, on one day and it could have been Sissy Spacek. There was no, I, I don't want to make it feel like, like she was rejected in any way for the part because that's not true. At various times, the choice was another way. And at times, she, she, we each started to choose different things. It never, in other words, the day that Sissy woke up and wanted to do it and the day that I was wanting her to do it never happened on the same day. If it had, she, you know, it would have worked out differently. There was very, I th there, it's, it was an impossible choice and I don't know how interesting a discussion it is, be, be, you know, about, about these, uh, these two women. I do think that now that the picture is over, the significant thing to me and the thing that had to happen is that I hope now that it would be unthinkable that Emma was anyone but Deborah. I hope and I believe she made the part her own. One, one of the things, one of the lines about you, you are one of those men and people talk about you in the industry and they say, oh, Jim Brooks, up, down, high, low, some days You're he's happy. You're depressing me just telling me about <laughs> Not it. Not at all. <laughs> yeah, I'm making you laugh. <laughs> but you, you had a line that just knocked me out. You were talking about the industry. And when I think of the struggle you went through to get terms of endearment on the screen and to us, you said that it's an industry where people just stand in line to be brutalized. <laughs> and they say, brutalize me, brutalize me. Is it, is it really that facetious a remark, or have you, have you put yourself on another plateau where one no longer feels that brutalize me aspect? Well, by that, I, I, you know, I, uh, they, once, once you get going, it gets, it's very tough. But people are in line to get going, so it's, it, it's just, this picture took, you know, first I, you, you feel like a Job, you know, four years, they tell you they're going to make it, then just as you're about to start, they tell you you're not going to make it. You know, you go to another studio, the studio executives change, you're out in the street again, except the amazing thing is you realize that the, the streets are crowded with jobs. It's everybody's story. I mean, it seems to be the way it's done. Uh, I don't know why, I guess, uh, you know, I don't know why. But every, everybody's taking four or five, six, seven years to make a picture, if they care about it, if they care about it. High concept pictures that somebody else wants to make get made rather quickly. I sit here and you talk this way and I think of what Barbara Streisand has gone through with Yentl, what Peter Yates did <laughs> to get the dresser made, what people who really care do. I mean, Shirley MacLaine sat there reading scripts and not signing any pieces of paper to make sure she would be available. Jeff Daniels waited two years yes, that's right. before he got that's the right. call. That's right. And your wonderful television people, of whom you are justifiably proud, like Danny DeVito for one, all of these people were waiting for the phone to ring and Jim Brooks to and say, Deborah's we start. And Deborah's been working a year now for a picture that shot for three months. She worked that much before and she's working that much now. I didn't realize, you mean Mike's murder was done? before she began working with you? Oh, yes, yes. She's, I, I'm terrible at dates, and she can tell you, but I think it's, she went into an enormous prep time for the picture.
I mean, you know, I have the postcards immediately after, uh, after Mike's murders was finished. Jim, was there an immediate rapport when, when we read the story about you having the meeting with Shirley MacLaine and Deborah Winger and Deborah going into the bathroom and cutting off her hair and coming out and saying, I'm ready to work? Did Shirley MacLaine and Deborah Winger lock into each other and know that what you needed was going to be there? Did you feel it when they were together? No, this is, this is, this is what happened. There was an immediate dynamic. There was something that happened that nobody could predict or nobody could say that's what should happen. That's the way we want them to be on day one. They were a distinct way on day one, a distinct way on day two. And I think because we had no other course, we all trusted that that would finally be good for the movie, and it was. They went their own way, and it was a very unusual way. Not, if, if I had to write out on paper how I'd like them to behave, I wouldn't have picked any part of it, but it worked. And it was always true to something. As you say, no, there was never any bull in it. And, and when the chips were down, they were always there for each other, too. When I examine the relationships in terms of endearment, and I think of you and your father and the years, and how even when you talk about the emotional reunion with your own father, that you can be witty and say, you burst into the hotel room and there was this Hospital old, room. <laughs> I'm sorry, hospital room. Oh, your father could have been rich. <laughs> you burst into the hospital room and there's this elderly man and you say, Daddy, and it's the wrong room. Yes, we haven't seen it for a long time. Yes, he left home when I was young. Just that I think it's there. I think it's all in terms of endearment. However no. you have couched it, Mr. Brooks, <laughs> it's all there. And I thank you for a wonderful film. Well, thank you, Brian. Thank you. You're welcome.